Hi, I'm Alice Hiller. After a rough year and a tough November, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this act of creative community. We're here to celebrate the deep healing play of Pascal Petit and Romelin Ante's brilliant new collections, Tiger Girl and Antiemetic for Homesickness. Both Pascal and Romelin are poets of courage as well as distinction. In a week when we learnt that the UK's foreign aid budget commitment will be broken, and while so many voices are being excluded from the global conversation, Pascal and Romelin give witness to a wider range of experiences than many poets. They also help us ask ourselves and our governments whose foot is being kept on whose head. Writing about life in the Philippines, Welsh gardens and the stunning nature reserves of central India, Pascal and Romelin move our minds to places of delight, even as they remind us that the world is far from being a fair or kind place for many human and creaturely lives and the fragile ecosystems and economies which sustain them. Our format tonight will be that Romelin is going to read from Antiemetic for Homesickness, her fabulous debut published by Chateau, followed by Pascal Petit from Tiger Girl, her brilliant eighth collection from Blood Axe. Afterwards, I'll open up a conversation between them. We'll then wind up with some questions from our audience, which Maya and Rachel will be fielding. So send them to us in writing, please. But before we go to the readings, I'd like to say a few words about Pascal and Romelin, who, as I said, are heroines of mine. Winner of the Andache Prize and the inaugural Laurel Prize for Mama Amazonica. Amongst very many other distinguished awards, Pascal Petit is also a radically empowering supporter of new voices in poetry through her mentoring, teaching and judging. As Romelin and I can both testify, but as so many other of the poets who've checked in with us now, will also say. Over eight collections, Pascal's poems have brought an artist's eye to the Amazon River and its rainforests, the arid landscapes of the Languedoc, and the markets and historic sites of Paris, including her beloved Jardin des Plantes. Tiger Girl, from which she'll be reading shortly, gives us one of the most life-filled portraits of a woman of colour and of mature years that I have read for a long time. It should be bought for that reason alone, aside from its many other treasures. Moving between continents, Tiger Girl documents Pascal's time growing up in Wales with her fierce half-Indian grandmother who took in washing, told fortunes, and made her garden a canvas equal to any artist's. The poems also respond to Pascal's recent experiences on trips to nature reserves in central India, celebrating the magnificent wild creatures who inhabit them. Pascal also registers the damage done to them by poverty-stricken poachers whose social class, her Indian great-grandmother, her great-grandfather's maid, also shared. Mentored, like me, by Pascal under the Jerwood Arvon scheme, which brought the three of us together, Romelin shares with Pascal an intuitive sense of the mythic within the everyday. She is similarly the recipient of many distinguished awards, 
including the Poetry London Prize, the Manchester Poetry Prize, the Primus Prize and the Creative Futures Platinum Award. Having grown up in the Philippines until she was 16, before coming to Wolverhampton and subsequently training as an NHS nurse and then counsellor, Romelin conveys how the wind has the ears of a wild boar and explains why you have to turn your shirt inside out to find your way home, whether that home is warmed by the smoke of a brummy accent or cooled by the night breeze off the ocean. Antiemetic for homesickness, Romelin's debut moves compellingly between the landscapes, foods and folklores of the Philippines and life as a nurse within the NHS while living in the black country. Exploring what it can mean to make the UK your home, Romelin also witnesses to the racism which so many people who come here have been subjected to and how they have made strong, creative lives, notwithstanding the challenges faced. The co-founder of the wonderful Harana Poetry with Kostya Chalakis, who is also here, for poets working with English as a parallel or additional language. Like Pascal, Romelin is both an outstanding poet and a key figure for the expansion of the possible in poetry, both through her own work and her support for others. She also gives us life from a nurse's point of view as never before, which is another reason to buy her essential antiemetic for homesickness. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to Roma Linante. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, it's really a special night for me because I'll be reading with, of course, my mentor from Joy with Arvin Mentorship Scheme, Pascal Petit. Um, I never really dreamed or thought that I would be reading with her. And also, I would be mentored by her. I could still remember the first time we met. Um, that was a Joy with Arvon interview. So they're inter interviewing people. And um, I think they're going to choose people who's going to be in the scheme. And I could remember, because coming from Wolverhampton, for me, London was like a jungle. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know where to go. But as soon as I entered the door, saw Pascal, at the table with Joe Bibi, I thought, you know what? I think I'm at the right place. And I think this is, there's a reason why I migrated here with my family. And that is to meet Pascal and to study the craft of poetry through her. And I remember at that time, I was like, Pascal, please take me on to this, onto this scheme. I'll do everything, I'll be, I'll be good, I promise. But then Pas the, the good thing about Pascal is she really believes in you. She really believes in what you write and in, in what you can give. And that's something that she has honed for me. And that's why I'm very thankful for her. And that's why I'm standing here tonight. So I'll be reading poems from my book, Antiemetic for Homesickness. The first poem that I'm going to read is called Names. This poem is my attempt to explore what it means to be exiled, not only physically, but also emotionally. I grew up in the Philippines with an absentee mother. So my mother left to work as a nurse abroad in order to provide a better chance in life for us. And I guess this poem is also my attempt to explore what it means to find a sense of belonging through the names that are given to us. Names. We are nameless and all names are ours. Emmanuel Lacaba. My mother's name is Rosanna, but when she left, I had other mothers, Rowena, Jimboy, Alma. I was named after the first syllables of my parents. I will always have them with me. My mother says not all names have meaning. Riverside, Manila, London, Corba. And someday I will forget all the commands I did not heed 
like the time I did not spin the plate clockwise before my father left for work, even if it would deliver him from accidents. Not all destinations are found in the junctions of your palm lines. Say, better life. Say, better life. And God knows I am repenting. Say, Airbus something. Say, one-way ticket. Keep following the sunset. Clouds are the closest things to my mother. Say, United Kingdom. Say, the Queen. NHS. Does winter always mean? Listen. Can you hear it? The loneliness of stretchers along any corridors. And the strongest part of me is the scar I hide underneath my fringe. My mother hides in the staff toilet to make long distance calls. Someday I will realize the woman lonely in her mansion is not my mother, but a future version of myself. I will chop bitter guards on the galaxy glimmer of her worktop. Shall we shorten your name on your name tag so it's easier to remember? Say, yes, please, sister. Say, please, sister, can I take this call? Say Arnold Marcus Harold. Say septicemia, alcohol poisoning, hernia. Say Jason Darius Vernon. Say cancer, myocardial infarction. Query is schizophrenia. Hides in the toilet. And I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. A boy sticks out his tongue and says, I do not have a mother. I punch him in the face the sanctity of blood. I am not scared because my mother has followed the sunset because she has burnt her lips on mash and gravy in a three minute lunch break because she calls me Anak, my child, my baby. She asks, what do you want for Christmas for your birthday? 1990 remains stuck on the other line. Say please, sister. Can I take this call? My breasts blossom. She can call me only by my name. I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. I can trek the mountain of Makolot, my father's rifle hanging from my back. I can carry myself, not how someone carries a side toxic drug, but how my mother hooks with her finger a drained bottle with blood clots, the weight of gemstones. I just want to say that um, the first draft of that poem, I remember I was at, I was at Jer with Arvon and I showed it to Pascal and Pascal said, Roma, you know what? You should enter this to Poetry London. The judge is Kwame Dawes. <laughs> do you know him? I think he'll really like it. And so I entered it because whatever Pascal says, you do it. <laughs> And then, and then it won the Poetry London. And if it's not for Pascal, um, I wouldn't really get that prize. So thank you so much, Pascal, for everything. Um, the next poem that I'm going to read is called Notes Inside a Balik Bayan Box. So overseas Filipino workers like my mother, like my colleagues, my friends, they spend a fraction of their monthly wage on small gifts and they put it inside a balik bayan box. Once full, they send that box back to the Philippines. So basically that's to remind their loved ones that I'm still thinking of you even though I'm away. And I remember getting a few balik bayan boxes from my mom. You know, I was standing by the door and I remember my brother being so excited and packing it and looking at all these gifts. So I guess this poem is my attempt to explore what is passed down to us through material things or through language, language that is noted and also language that is left unsaid. Notes inside a Balikbayan box. 
Dear son, in my place, here is a Balikbayan box. Here are the Lebron James rubber shoes size 9 and the video game tapes to replace all the palm cakes I owe you for every Simbangabi or PTA meeting I could not attend. I promise I'll be there for Christmas. I know I have been saying this for a decade now. Find the E45 cream for your grandma's tissue dry skin, a stack of incontinence pads and tubes of barrier balm. Between you and me, every time I roll old people onto their sides and lift their knees to their chests for suppositories, I ask myself, who does this for her? Tell Tita to leave her husband, her school sweetheart, whose mistresses are Majong and Sabong. Tell her not to bear the stink of his armpits. In the box, find the Gucci Bloom perfume and scar creams. Tell her, I haven't forgotten our vows when we were young and our fingers smelled of lihing mi candies, our walang iwanan oath to never leave each other. Dear son, in my place, here is a like buy-in box. Rip all the packaging tape. Every gift inside is yours. Work your hands hard until there's nothing left. Learn that to survive, we must have strong arms. To carry a tray full of medicine and not let one drop. To push a hyperventilating woman with speed and care to the maternity wing. To lift and sit a skin and bone man down on his chemo chair. To gauge the weight of a rose before you lay it onto a coffin. Take this box inside our house. That is all I ask you to carry for now, my son. So I came from a clan of healers. It's really true. You know the, the old saying that all Filipinos are nurses? <laughs> That's true. We all came from healers and shamaness and um, witch doctors. So my paternal grandparents, they're shamaness and witch doctors. And my side of the family, my mother, my aunties, they're all nurses. The next poem that I'm going to read is called The Shaman, the Servant. And this poem explores how healing is viewed from different sides of the world. And also it explores what distance can or, or how distance can impact on someone's relationship. The Shaman, the Servant for my grandfather. And while you were oiling your hands with langis ahas, whispering incantations to the hammock of your palms, I pushed a needle in and the patient fainted. And while you could erase a headache with a blow of breath or draw out poisons by placing buhay na bato on a serpent's bite, I could only clean mold on a wooden bed with gauze and saline. And while there were you of villagers at your door, when stars at dawn were rock salts that buried scarab legs in glass vials, a pack outside Lidl trailed me on their bicycles, shouting ching chong. And while your house grew with gifts, a rooster Crowing in a bayong, a sack of corn, whips of ripe jackfruits. A patient woke and accused me of stealing her job. And when you stash your chants into a chink in the ceiling beam and dial the telephone, all I could say was, I am fine and I've got to go. Once you took in a hawk and bandage its wing with cacahuate leaves. And had I known that by August, the phone would fur with dust, 
I would have pressed the handset to my ear instead of telling you, I've got to go. It's midnight here. So I'll read two more poems. My mother has taught me, I think, the, the best lesson that I could learn from life. And that is how to be the perfect loser. Because <laughs> my mother is such a loser. <laughs> when I say a loser, I say it with pride. And I say this because if, if you imagine, you know, she left the country, she, she lost the country, she lost her family, and also she lost time, time and years that could have developed her relationships with her children. And also as a nurse, she lost some patients, whether those patients died or, you know, um, get well soon, um, she, she lost them. So this next poem, is in the voice of the loser mother. And the title of the poem is Anagolai. Anagolai is the goddess of lost things in Philippine mythology. Anagolai. I do not ask for divine reappearance. Let the misplaced objects recede in the heat of an isolated island where sunlight snakes across the underwater sand. Let the lost things grain the night sky against the blurred edges of Milky Way. I had traveled so far I could no longer hear the waves heaving onto a shore, accessible only through below the towers of limestone rocks, where a gap closes like a promise at high tide. Anagolai, help me find a torch pen in the peril of a drug trolley. Help me retrieve the will of my patient who pushes all pills aside with the back of a hand. Guide me, for I have walked against the wind that is always homeward. For I return to find my own children tread past me as if I were a palm tree trashed by thunderstorms. Goddess of lost things, today, a space council names an asteroid after you. And tonight, another world ebbs, a punctured lung. A torch sticks on, its beam leads to my children's sand-speckled feet. Let me look up to remember, the fifth vital sign has always been pain. Let me find a prick of light gliding like a plane, or if not, the rhythm of a shockable heart. So the last poem that I'm going to read is the title poem of the book. And before I finish, I just want to say thank you again for coming. And thank you so much for Pascal for reading with me. It's been such an honor. It's been such a pleasure that Alice and Rachel and Maya are helping and showing such support for us. Thank you. And Let's enjoy Pascal's reading. <laughs> so, you know, when I was growing up and I was a teenager and you were full of angst and you're like thinking, oh, how could my mom leave me? She, how could she take care of people from abroad while she couldn't even take care of her own children in the Philippines? So I was quite melodramatic. And at one point I was even an emo, you know, like black hair. <laughs> Black eye, black eyeliner, et cetera, et cetera, listening to, to emotional music. And then when I came to the UK, I realized that actually my mother has carried so much, much, much more than I have carried as a, as a left behind child. You know, forget migration, forget the 12 hour shift every single day at the hospital. Just look at the UK's weather. Who wouldn't be depressed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> if, especially if you're in Wolverhampton, it always rains here. So this poem is my attempt to understand how my mom pursue and plow through life without us. 
antiemetic for homesickness. A day will come when you won't miss the country na nagluwal sayo. You'll walk on greeted streets, light snow showing you like a mother's warmth. A vertigo of distant lights will not deceive you. Bury all the kisses of yesterday in the fold of your handkerchief. The illuminated star-shaped lanterns, the tansan tambourines. But keep the afternoon your father sold his buffalo to rent a jeepney to take you to the airport. The driver who spat out phlegm with the trajectory of a grasshopper that lands on the ground. Keep the list you wrote the night before you left. A promise to not return till you become somebody. Keep the cassette tapes, your children's voices shrill as the edges of winter stars. Keep the booklet of a lady of perpetual help in your uniform pocket, powder blue like her robe. Say the rosary, feel each kamagong bead. Rest on a pillow to sense the rise and fall of your husband's chest. Listen to Tagalog songs. They will help you sleep through the cold scratches of December. Here is the tea-stained smile of a kababayan who invites you to a party. Go! No matter how heavy the day has been and how many corpses you have carried within. Enjoy the home-cooked pancit guisado, the roasted pig's head, the blood-red apple in its mouth. A day will come when you, when you won't need an antiemetic for homesickness. You will accept the patient's relative who always buzzes for a commode, the search for the missing boot of an a and &E habitue, the village drunk, you will learn to heal the wounds of their lives and the wounds of yours. Love, even the smoke of a Brahmi accent on your face. So here is the karaoke mic. Sing your soul out until there's El Nino in your throat and you can drink all the rain of Wolverhampton. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. wow. And, <laughs> and let, let us please welcome my mentor, and I think she is everyone's mentor. She has bestowed so many gifts for so many people, and she keeps going. She keeps bestowing a lot of gifts and a lot of knowledge. Please, let's all welcome Pascal Petit. Hello, hello. Um, this is the book that you must buy and must read over and over again. I am so proud of Roma. And that was so moving to hear you read and to read with you. And to be here with Alice and Maya and Rachel and or everyone who's come. So thank you for coming. It really was um, a dream mentoring job. I had four of them. I had Roma, Alice Hiller, who's hosting us today, Yvonne Reddick and Serafima Kennedy. All incredible and we're all friends now. I'm going to read from Tiger Girl and uh, I'll start with the long poem, get it out of the way. Um, <clears throat> so Tiger Girl is actually really my grandmother who kind of brought me up on, well she brought me up, but also um, told me stories about being left in a tent in India, in the jungle, 
uh, by herself when she was a baby and how a tiger entered. And um, I have always wanted to dare to go to tiger forests and be close to a tiger myself. So that's what I, I went and did. I went to three national parks where you can actually see, see the tigers. They're, they're in the wild, they're in their territories, uh, but the guides know where to go. <clears throat> it, it is, however, impossible to be there without realizing that the forest guards are there and some of them are patrolling on elephants and they are working very hard to keep the animals alive because there is so much poaching and um, a lot of the poaching is for Chinese traditional medicine unfortunately for tigers um, and for pangolins and other creatures um, but it's also for a lot of the birds are for good luck and a lot of the owls um, <clears throat> and uh, also the tigers and the leopards often get killed by the locals who live in the buffer zone who used to live in the forest and were ousted to make the national parks uh, because they have their very precious cows and buffaloes and so the best situations are where the government are able to um, compensate them for loss of animals otherwise they poison carcasses and the tigers and bears die so this is the forest at night in the forest in the forest i saw a man sewing an owl's eyes shut the owl was on a leash and the man pulled it to make it flutter and attract songbirds to mob his decoy he told me how much he could earn from warblers in cages i wondered which was worse the blind eagle owl or thrushes glued to sticks the deeper i went the more i saw what is worse, asked the sky, a girl with sewn eyes or glued lips. The deeper I walked, the harder I looked, although it was dark and there were no stars. 4,000 rupees for a barn owl to be sacrificed for Diwali to light up the dark with dark. I went even deeper into the core, patrolled by forest guards on tuskers, but it was night and the bulls were chained. I saw another man who led me to a cave, which he called his vault. And there was a tigress inside giving birth to striped gold. I said, my eyes are stitched and my lips sealed. And he placed coins in my hand, said it was jungle currency. And I knew then I was holding the eyes of cubs. I said to the poacher, I'm not from here, I do not judge, but the eyes mewled in my hands. So I ran through every coppice and every clearing and looked at the moon whose eye was sewn shut. I passed the firefly tree and the flame of the forest, and I swear there were leopards dangling from their boughs. I came to the crocodile bark tree and the ghost tree as the first rays peered through night's lids. But the sun couldn't look at what I had seen. The sun couldn't wake the sambar, chital, antelope or gazelle. So I was the only witness of those luminous herds with fire trees on the altars of their brows, all sacrificed for good fortune. Goddess Lakshmi, forgive them as you ride your owls. And that was long ago now, but still I'm running through that forest, watched by the moon eye and the sun eye. But now 
It's a forest of peeling red bark, of leopards with paws sawn off, stuffed into pockets for luck. While in the tantric market, a trader slices a tiger, giving it new stripes. One stripe for a lakh of rupees. I run through thickets of dust trees until I reach the realm of the sloth bear, where a cub clings to his electrocuted mother. And here I find a man laughing as he hooks a cane through the cub's nose and teaches him to dance. The night is black as bear fur, its muzzle bleeding after eating honey baited with explosives. How many rupees for the galaxies in a gallbladder? I run more slowly now, afraid of traps for my ankles, snares for my neck. You could say my flight is a jerky dance, the stars my audience with shielded eyes. Because the ringmaster has arrived in heaven, with his flaming hoops archangels must leap through. Where are the angels with fangs that sever windpipes? Angel fangs around a black hole's neck, bought in the black market. Goddess Durga, who rides the sky tiger, forgive us. You could say the stick that makes my head jerk is a bad branch from the tree of life, but I swear there's a tree of good if only I could find it. For the cub that survived whose claws are new moons that light up my path. And even though it's day now, the forest has drawn blinds over itself. I climb a hide and as I climb, the trees grow higher. Banyan bowls pierce the ladder and hiss like snakes with skeleton leaves. I pass choirs of langurs with silver fur and ebony faces, their echoing barks getting louder. But even up here, vendors are shouting, ten craw for a white tiger, five craw for a black leopard. Here, where the blacksmith forges leg traps in the night market, here too there are trees with scratch marks, but no tigers. Unless you count the meat without skin, all bones pulled out, for just one rib of bog can buy a cow. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me whisper it. I saw an archangel with its paw mangled in a trap for what seemed an aeon. I saw a man waiting for it to weaken while he ate his meal on a teak leaf. And when he had finished, I saw him whittle a stick. And when the archangel was too weak to move, he jabbed his stick into its mouth so no one would hear its music. I saw him pick up a branch and batter the spine, and I knew then that the branch was from the tree of secrets. For how else did he know where creatures of light walk on our earth, their footprints that glow on the path, saying, this way, this way to my kingdom? Then the man got out his skinning knife. Half an hour it took him to flay the hide intact with its arabesques of bulldozed gardens. If it were possible to remake the creature from its pelt, I would do it. But the man sold the pelt because his family was hungry. And I vowed then never to eat again. I descended the spiral ladder and with bamboo thorns and plant fibre, I sewed my eyes shut. And with resin from the tree of love, I glued my lips. So, a happier poem now. Uh, because as you go through the tiger forests, um, there are clearings and they are full of birds. And this is the green bee eater. 
more precious than all the gems of Jaipur, the green bee eater. If you see one singing tree, 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 with his space black bill and a rufous cap, his robes all shades of emerald, like treetops glimpsed from a plain, his blue cheeks, black eye mask, and the delicate tail streamer like a plume of smoke. You might dream of the forests that once clothed our flying planet. And perhaps his singing is a spell to call our forests back, tree by tree by tree. So I'll read one of the portraits of my grandmother. Uh, this is, I'd lived with her when I was a baby for two years, and then I was sent back to Paris, uh, which was horrible. And then when I was seven, I went to live with her again in Wales. This is in mid Wales, in a council house. And this is the arrival. Her tigress eyes. When I met you, that first evening, and I was a seven-year-old, perched on your settee, not understanding English. All I could see was your eyes. I also sensed the Queen of India in a double exposure. The summer sky reflected in her irises, sapphire glints from her father blue eyes among golden groves of rods and cones. Behind the tigress, your black eyes glistened with forest ferns. Birds nested between them. Your glasses made your living room a fairy green. Did I dream awake? Or was I hallucinating after the night crossing and long drive to Wales? Or the surprise of being left in a place where I could start to sprout roots? Perhaps I recalled being here before as a baby because however unfamiliar it felt with the strange language, the animals that surrounded us as if I'd landed in paradise, I knew I was back home. Your eyes told me this when you looked at me, your hands making the sign for food and milk. Just as a tigress attends to her cub, licks her of dangerous scents and brings her spirit deer from the meadow. Then over the years, through example, goes on to teach her how to hunt for herself, how to survive among the teeth and claws she will have to one day battle. Seven years, I thrived in your warmth. And at the end, you battered me away to go find my own territory, my own strength. So two more poems, and this is the batting away. Uh, one of the amazing owls in the forest is the owlet, the jungle owlet. Owlet means this a day flying owl. Jungle Owlet. What you didn't tell me is how poachers cut off their claws and break bones in one wing so they can't perch or fly. That their eyes are sold as poochers, boiled in broth so herdsmen can see in the dark. You didn't say how sorcerers keep their skulls, their barred feathers, their livers and hearts, or how they drink their blood and tears. You didn't mention how a tortured owl will speak like a young girl to reveal where treasure is buried. My kind granny, who took me in when I was homeless, 
who sat down this very evening after I had gone to bed and wrote mother a stern letter telling her that she must take me back. It doesn't matter where, Paris, Wales, Timbuktu. No more excuses. You are tired. And here your slanted writing is almost illegible. But what I think it says is that you cannot look after a teenage owlet. You use your favourite pet name. I've never spoken of this before. I call it up my gullet from the pit at the bottom of my 13th year, along with my crushed bones, my stolen blood, and I spit it out through my torn off beak in language that passes for human. So I'm going to finish with a poem that Roma asked for. Um, and thank you all very much for listening and for, to Alice and Roma and Rachel and Maya for organizing all this. Um, this poem called The Anthropocene well, I wrote it, it was about a year ago. No, it was last, yeah, last autumn when there were so many hurricanes. And I saw uh, this bridal dress made out of 3,000 peacock plumes. And peacocks, of course, are what you hear all the time in the tiger forests. The Anthropocene. A bride wears a train of 3,000 peacock plumes. She walks down the aisle like a planet trailing her seas. Every wave an eye shivering with the memory of the display. How the trees turned to watch as the bird raised the fan of his tail. Emerald forests, bronze atolls, lapis islands, every eye a storm held in abeyance. Thank you again for listening. That was fantastic, Pascal. Thank you so much. Um, it was just, and it's amazing to hear the two of you reading together. Um, and um, I thought before we go to our, our, our audience's questions, I've just got a few um, that I'd, I'd like to ask you both because I've lived with, loved and thought about your collections um, you know, since they were published. And this is a great chance to ask you about them. And um, my first question is about making worlds visible to you um, that, are, uh, that are known to you, but that are not your readers. And um, Pascal, I'm thinking about your poems about wildlife in Indian national parks, but also about your poems about rural life in Wales. And at Romelin, I'm thinking about your poems about life in the Philippines, but also the day-to-day -day life of a nurse in the NHS. Did, did it feel important to you know, we can really feel the world that you've, you've made in your poems. And I wondered if, if that was an important, you know, part of the process of making them. Uh, Pascal. Roma, would, you, would you like to speak first, Roma? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Alice. That's a very, I think that's a very expandable and very important question. I mean, in the UK, Filipino nurses are the second highest NHS staff, immigrant NHS staff next to Indians. In the USA, the highest number of immigrant nurses are Filipino nurses. Um, most recently, especially during COVID, you know, during this pandemic, the West has really depended on, on, on migrant nurses. But 
the truth is little is known to us or about us and little is known about our own narratives, our own lives. And I feel that mostly people only see us on the surface without knowing our past and our own tales. Why did we come here? So I have people commenting on me before. So you're, you're Filipino. So if you're Filipino, where are you from? Are you from Korea then? So they don't even know what a Filipino is. There are also some readers, like comments. You shouldn't really read Goodreads comments, but I do. <laughs> I do read my reviews because I wanted to improve, but there are some even comments that says, oh, I don't know, I can't relate. But for me, the truth is unfamiliarity the state of being unknown is not the same as non-existence. Migrant nurses exist. We do exist within, in this world. But somehow, we are not um, known. And what, what puzzles me is, why is the United Kingdom or the West so dependent on a sector of people that has so little voice and that has never been heard of and this is the reason why i wrote to, to to really show them not only the physical place where we came from but also to to show them our narrative what propels us to do this fantastic answer thank you so much thank you uh, roma that was fantastic yes so yeah in tiger girl um I, I I wanted to to honor uh, my grandmother and write a book of grandmother love poems, you know, um, and acknowledge that she you know she came she was the daughter of um, a maid and she was taken in by her father's white family and. Um, she was very poor as well when, when I lived with her in Wales. So we, we didn't have um, flush toilets or running water or anything like that. So it was, it was really quite poor. Uh, not that that's, you know, children don't, don't notice things like that. What I did notice was an enormous garden, or at least it seemed enormous to me, and uh, lots of animals and uh, the incredible world of the garden, which she worked in all the time, and which I worked in for her as well. Um, so that was one half of the book. And the other, of course, is where she came from, and the story about the tiger, and my wanting to see tigers, uh, um, and, and to see this wildness that she came from too, that, she, that she'd encountered as a baby and the, the terrible realization that that wildness is so so threatened and endangered and um, you know and even now even the tigers that are safe um are fighting each other you know um daughters kill mothers uh, and and so on um because the forests are too small for them even though the tourists are only allowed in 20% of the national parks, but uh, there's, there's still not enough space. They have enormous territories. And having seen the tigers and seen how, what tigers, I've seen wild jaguars as well in the Amazon rainforest, to see what they are like in their territories in the wild is so different from seeing them in zoos. And of course there are far more tigers in zoos than there are in, in India. There's about 2,800 in India and only, you know, a handful elsewhere. So, yeah, so that, that was my, the world I was trying to bring forward. No, well, I mean, you really, you know, most of us will never get to those national parks and to, to see them through someone's eyes, to see them emotionally, rather than just on a wildlife documentary is incredibly powerful um, and, and I really appreciated that. Now my next um, question is we both work with a powerful healing female figure. For Pascal it's your grandmother, for Romelin it's your nurse mother. Did it feel important to you to honour the way in which we as women can nurture each other? 
Um, if, yes, definitely. I mean, in antiemetic for homesickness, the mother, the, the mother is the one who leaves to provide a better life for her family. So if you think about it, the mother looks away from the very essence of being a mother, which is to take care of her own children. And I think by, in, by, by shedding light on that fact, I also needed to shed light on the fact that in, in leaving, there could also be healing. So even though the mother has left, that is sort of an act of sacrifice, almost, that, that, that even though she's left, she still heals. She still heals the socioeconomic problems that her family has. She, she heals people um, abroad. She heals people where she works. And that's very important for me, not only as a nurse, but I think as a daughter of a migrant nurse. I think it's very, I, I, I feel very similar to Pascal um, writing about the, the voice of the poet is really healing the world that is full of poaching and full of um, full of annihilation of of the natural world. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, so when I was with my grandmother, uh, I was um, well. I I was in various homes and things in France. And if I was with my parents, it was, you know, a very bad experience. And I eventually went to live with my mother when I was a teenager, uh, when my grandmother kind of threw me out, which she had to do. You know, she was tired. And she had a teenager on her hands. Um, but uh, my mother was me severely mentally ill and couldn't really look after me and was a malevolent force for me so I had a malevolent maternal figure there and, and it was so, so it was wonderful for me to have a chance in this book to write about a really benevolent figure who not only was benevolent but was actually a very powerful person she was um, known as the local witch where we lived and um, as a good witch but she was and she also had an extraordinary uh, second sight. So I did have the experience of being with her and her telling me about ghosts and seeing, um, for example, she saw the postman who lived down our lane. Uh, she said, I've just seen him walking up the lane. And he said, he said hello to me, but as if everything was normal, but his feet were floating off weren't touching the ground so I knew he was a ghost I know that he has just died and he had so you know there was always those kind of experiences going on and she also used to tell fortunes and people important people in the village used to come like the vicar and and the doctor would come to have their fortunes told so so I would go with her as well to fairs to to um, see her tell fortunes no well I think you know, when looking back historically, women have been disempowered for centuries. And it's really important, but, you know, that we actually make work that honours female power, female goodness. Um, and it, you know, it just seems to me a very positive thing to do. But at the same time, um, these healing figures work within very injurious and injured societies. And you both show them as being capable of deeply wounding people who are dependent on their care and provision. Pascal, you spoke about um, your grandmother returning to your mother. Romanin, you talked about being separated from your mother. And um, in each case, though, the wounding, wounding behaviour is really a result of larger socioeconomic pressures. The fact that women are, you know, your mother left the Philippines to give you and your siblings a better life, Romanin. She didn't, you know, it was the only way she could materially improve your lives. Um, you know, your, your grandmother was, had very limited resources, Pascal, so was it also important to just show how, you know, we're now talking post or in the pandemic about the impact of, of material strain, of poverty on families, was it also important just to show that in difficult circumstances, even loving people can 
can act in injurious ways, you know, through, through no real volition of their own? Or, or does that feel too challenging? Um, no, I, I mean, it can't be challenging because you, you need to write the truth. And um, I think for me, the, 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 you know, I was 13, so the injury wasn't being moved from my grandmother. I was still a child, still accepting whatever happened. Um, the, the, the real wound was not being allowed to grieve her loss when I lived with my mother. That, that was the wound. And, and I never even realized that I wasn't allowed to grieve. I just knew it was a subject, a taboo subject, and, and you know, that I wasn't allowed to. Yeah, I, allowed to. I wasn't allowed to mourn the her grandmother, who I saw as my mother, because my mother couldn't bear that, you know. Yes, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think what you said a while ago as well, Alice, really resonated with me when you said, that um, we left because we are propelled by socioeconomic circumstances. See, even though in Antimedic for Homesickness, the left behind child was left by her nurse mother, this, this story is not unique to me. It happens to, uh, to, to a lot of children, millions of children around the world. You know, your parents don't even need to to go abroad to be, for you to be a left behind child in China. Um, Parents from provinces go to richer um, cities to, to, to help financially with the family. Now, my mother left because she really had no choice. We had no choice. But then again, she made a choice. So her only choice is having, is having not any choice, basically. Um, but I guess she left knowing that the people she will leave behind will be hurt. And that as well, that knowledge, I'm sure, hurt her as well in return. So for me, it's not just me who is wounded, but it is also the mother who is wounded. It's, it's very, very, um, it's very timely and relevant to this day as well. I think, especially when I see my colleagues, you know, um, or my mother, my mother even, who's been going all around the country helping in the front line and my other Filipino colleagues who, who choose to not go back home, as in, in their homes, like across the street, so that they don't put their children at risk of COVID. So mothers have always been leaving their children, and this story has always been happening. But then again, it's not just the children who get hurt. The wounded one is also the mother. And I think that's, that's what anti-emetic for homesickness is about as well. Yeah. No, well, I, I think that, that really comes across. And it's, it's very important. Now, I, I see we're coming towards the end of the time. And I just, I'm going to have one final question. While neither of you holds back from speaking about difficult subjects, both collections give the gift to their reader of being able to abide in beauty. Romalyn, you let us glimpse the decolonized life and work the community in the Philippines. Pascal, your work gives itself deeply to the natural world. Was that an important thing to do, to give the gift of beauty when we're facing so much difficulty at the moment? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, you can't, I, you, I don't think you can't write about the threats to the natural world without showing why, um, uh, without sh trying to show uh, it's it's actually a real challenge to show the awe and the wonder of it, because that's you know something I've, I've always felt, and um, so um, yeah, so that um, you you have to show what it is you're trying to protect, and um, what um, you know what. Uh, what the non-human world is that because I, I I keep getting these flashes which are images of the planet without non-human life in it and um, without animals and that's to me is like hell 
So mm. I don't want that to happen, you know, so I, but I need to show the beauty and, and the awe and the majesty and the wonder of tigers. Absolutely. Keep, yeah, stay with the programme. Yeah, um, Romelin, about beauty, yes. I really echo what Pascal has said, and I think it's, it's very true to me. It's also one of the reasons why I, when Chato asked me what kind of cover I wanted, I really wanted it to be colorful with some insignias and images of the Philippines, you know, the sunbird and the, 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 the um, abanico flower. Because for me, these images, these beautiful images, as we say, or as we call them, for me, they serve as an as anchors, anchors, and also as guides that will lead us back to healing and perhaps to hope. It's it's very similar to what we hope for now as well. Isn't it? We we look for that beauty again when we can go to our favorite coffee shop again, or we can hug our parents again, or meet up with our friends. And I think that's very important to look for beauty because beauty gives hope. Well, I think that's the perfect note on on which to end. I'm going to, you know, thank everyone who's joined us. I'm going to especially thank Pascal and Romelin for these two um, brilliant, brilliant books. You know, the season of gifting is coming upon us. These have to be top of your list. Um, we're going to, after the recording has ended, we're going to go to people's questions, but this has been a stunning evening. Thank you so much. And um, everybody buy the books. Thank you very much now.